But it sure was a pretty song. Boy, I'll tell you what, I really had a good dinner. My wife cooked a real good dinner, cooked two big old rolls and a whole bunch of potatoes and stuff, and had the kids out. It was was in honor of uh, Shannon's birthday. And there wasn't anything left when those kids left. I mean, boy, I mean, it was just, uh, they cleaned up. Yeah, it's good. That's pork. I know. That's. My lands. We'll dismiss church and I'll go to homeland. Now, uh, but also we had some of Zeke's strawberries that he donated to the youth, and Susie picked strawberries, and boy, they were good. Oh my, they were hard, but they were really good. They were crispy. I don't know why, but they. Boy, they had the best flavor. Maybe there's a little bit green. I don't know, but they sure were good. I, I love strawberries. And that's the only thing we had anything left of when we got through, and I finished them off just before I came to church. Jerry, yes. Did you hear about that preacher? He dinner just played and had tickets for dinner. And accidentally, the old rooster was just a crow, and he said, what's that old rooster going about? And I said, well, he just had a son in his ministry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Had some children that entered the ministry. Yeah, that's good. Turn, if you will, to Romans. Romans, the first chapter. The other day I was teasing Wayne. I said something about I hadn't. Yes, what? First chapter. First? Yeah, first chapter. I was teasing Wayne. I said I hadn't seen you since you quit church. But he hadn't really quit church, but they've changed his schedule. And But I kind of wished I hadn't said it after I saw what a good job he did mowing the yard. I thought, well, I shouldn't have done that, but. So we're glad to see you back in church, Wayne. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> first chapter, first verse. I started on this this morning. I thought I'd get to finish this, but I, I didn't get to. And so I want to try to conclude this sermon uh, tonight. We're going to have a baptism. I always love Sunday nights when we have baptisms. It just seems like such a good spirit. And we're always thankful for that, to be able to baptize. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, separated to be an apostle are called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. This morning I was bringing out that Paul said that he was a doulos, a servant. And doulos means bond servant. And a doulos can be someone that is bound in chains, in other words, serve against his will that's brought under subjection. Or he can be one that willingly serves. In other words, gives up his will for his master's will. And we are either one or the other. We either willingly serve Christ or we will be a bond servant, a slave servant of Satan, and we have no choice in the matter. And I used to wonder, and Satan is is very shrewd the way he works. Uh, uh, he's he's, he's, He's very shrewd in that not everybody's the same, and he doesn't station everybody the same. In other words, you have some uh, people that are uh, what you call diabolical. They're on death row. And so we tend to point at those people and say, oh, he's just full of Satan. But, you know, Satan also controls the good moral people. And and, and he he works in uh, how he wants to work. And I believe we're living in a day when uh, Satan is really busy and we just see more and more crime and, and, and more and more just no conscience and and, and I think we're really living in terrible days. But you see, what the people don't realize, and if you're not saved, one thing you don't realize is that you were brought under the power of Satan, whether you realize it or not. And it says that he is the prince and the power of the air. You see, Satan is the god of this world. Satan is the god of this world. This world is not our home. We're just passing through, right? But he is the, the god of this world system. And it says that he takes us captive or or the the people that aren't saved at his will. We're no match for him whatsoever. The world, the the, the sinner is no match for him whatsoever. And in the Psalms, it says, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. He he is likened into a fowler. Now, the fowlers today use shotguns and bird dogs. They're people that hunt birds. But years ago, during that time period, the fowlers would use a circular net with a drawstring, and 
they would find a covey of, of birds on the ground, perhaps quail or pheasant or whatever, about roosting time, and they were very skilled at throwing that net over that covey and then drawing the string. And, and that little bird, those birds had no, they, they just didn't have a chance. There's no way they could escape from the snare of the fowler. And I remember telling you that when I was a small child, my dad owned a store called 8th Street Grocery. I was about 12 years old. And right down the hill uh, from our store, there was an old man who lived in a concrete block uh, house. It wasn't really a house. It had been a garage. And, and he was living in there. had a dirt floor. And I went down. I like to go by and visit with him. And I went by one time, and it was snow on the ground. And it had snowed, but the sun was out, and it was, it was beginning to thaw. But I went by to see him. I knocked on the door, but when I got to the door, I noticed he had a, a cord that was, was strung from his door out to a big old heavy wooden door that was propped up with a stick. And he let me come in, and, and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm catching birds. And he'd raise that door up, put a stick under it, and, and he'd put breadcrumbs and stuff there under that door, and little old sparrows would fly down there, and then they'd go under that door, and then he'd pull that string. The door smashed those birds. And, and I thought, why would he want to do that? I mean, kill a little... But he ate them. He had spares, blue jays, anything that got on that door. That was supper. And he had a whole coffee can full of little birds, little, little uh, sparrows that, that he had picked them. And they're not about that big around the time they're picked. But, but he, he would eat those things. And, uh, I, but you'd watch those birds, and it was, kind of, it was very interesting because I think, well, it looks like the birds in the, sea, in the trees could see what was happening to the birds on the ground. Because the door would slam and the birds in the trees or those close by, they'd kind of flutter away a little bit and then he'd go get the dead birds out from under the door and he'd reset the trap, go back in the house. Pretty soon the other little birds, they'd sit there a little while and one of them would hop down there and he'd hop over under that door and then and he'd cheep and then here comes some more and pretty soon there'd be eight or nine little birds under that door and then he'd spring the tra trap again. And you'd think, you'd think that those birds could see what was happening. I thought, how dumb those little birds are. But you know, humans, same way. Satan traps the world. They be, they're captive at his will. Now, it says in Jude, and here's something that's always been sad to me. In, in, in speaking of the angels that kept not their first estate, in uh, Jude, the sixth verse, says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In other words, what he's saying is there is no hope for them. No hope whatsoever. But do you realize that if you're lost, if you don't know Christ, you also are just reserved for judgment? If, there's, if something doesn't happen, if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you are just as lost and just as hell-bound as those angels that are in chains and darkness now waiting their judgment day. Now, the angels are different than humans in that humans have a chance to be saved, but salvation was never provided for angels. The angels, I mean, the, the, the fallen angels, they believe and tremble. Satan believes and trembles, the Bible says. But see, salvation wasn't provided for him because angels cannot have a kinsman redeemer. Every, they can't procreate. Uh, angels don't have offspring. Each angel was created individually. In order to have a salvation, you must have a kinsman redeemer. That's the reason God came in the likeness of flesh, took upon himself human flesh, son of Adam, so that he could be a kinsman redeemer, so that he could redeem the human race. But angels can never have a redeemer. Those angels that, that fell, they are reserved and chains in darkness awaiting the judgment. But if you're not saved, you're just as bad off unless you get saved. Satan has got you in his trap. He's got you right where he wants you. And there is absolutely no way that you can recover yourself from the snare of the fowler unless Christ and the Holy Spirit does a work and sets you free. There's no way. There's no way that you have the power. There's nothing in your power that you can do. Now notice the Apostle Paul says that he was called, there was a special appointment to be an apostle of Christ separated unto the gospel of God. He said, that's my job, is to preach the gospel. Now, I want you to notice something, and we will go ahead now and turn...
to uh, verse 16. Look at verse 16 of that same chapter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now notice what he didn't say. He didn't say it is a power of God unto salvation. He said what? It is the power of God unto salvation. Meaning there is no other way. Just as the Apostle Paul was appointed by Christ and separated unto the gospel, Jesus Christ was appointed by the Father to be the Savior of the world. And there's no other way. And occasionally I will hear people, and even an author, I've been reading an author's books, and he says, well, you know, the Indian have their own religion, and, and uh, the different countries have their own religions, and they're just as good as ours. <coughs> in other words, leave them alone. Don't go in there and try to uh, preach to the Indians or to the Buddhists or all of them, because the main thing is, as long as you're sincere. How many has ever heard that before? It really doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're sincere. That's terrible. Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. What is? The death, the burial, the resurrection is the power of God unto salvation. And there's not another way. Used to be a meat inspector come to, our, come to my store when I was under state inspection, and I began to witness to him, and I believe he went to... I don't remember whether it was Episcopal or, or Presbyterian. I don't remember where he went, but him and his wife and children were very faithful in attending, but it was evident that this man didn't know Christ as his Savior. Every other word out of his mouth was a cuss word. But I began to witness to him and witness to him, and I gave him gospel tracts, and he got saved. And so he began to talk to his wife, and she said, well, I want to talk to our preacher. So they called her preacher over to the house, their preacher over to the house, and and, 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 and Bob asked this preacher, he said, well, <clears throat> this fellow that I go to his meat market, he says there's uh, only one way to be saved and ye must be born again. And the preacher said, well, that's one way you can do it. He said, that, yeah, that's one way. That's all right if you want to be saved that way. No, that's the way. That is the only way. And Peter said, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved than what? Through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the only one that God hath appointed to be Savior. The only one. Moses was a great man. Abraham was a great man. John the Baptist was a great man. There's been some great prophet, pro, prophets. But Christ is the only one that it was appointed to be the Savior of the world. And do you know why that is? Because he's the only one that can take away sin. He is the perfect sacrifice. I would like to show you something, or I just want to read this to you in Hebrews, the first verse, first chapter. God, who has sundry times in a diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When he by himself purged our sins. He's the only one that could do it. And so therefore... Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation. It's the only way, and it is the only hope for a lost and dying world. But now look what happens. People retrogress. Now, uh, there's, been a, uh, there's been a doctrine that's gone on for a long time, and, and they teach in psychology that we're just getting better and better in every way. Have you ever heard that? Better and better every way, better and better every day. Have you heard that? Boy, I did. Even in school, they was teaching. We're getting better and better every day. And there's some preachers that even claim that, that we're just going to get better and better and better and usher in the kingdom. Through education and through higher education, we're just going to usher in the kingdom. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that man retrogresses. I have never heard of anybody front sliding. Have you ever heard that? 
No. What do we do? We backslide. You see, it's a constant struggle. It takes prayer. It takes Bible study. It takes commitment. What? Not to backslide. It's the easiest thing in the world to just backslide. Why? It's a downhill. It's downhill. And the whole human race is backsliding. Now, look what he says here, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What does it say they do? They hold the truth in unrighteousness. What's he saying here? They know the truth. They know the truth, but they're holding the truth. You see, it's a sin if we know the truth, but don't share the truth. It's not enough that you know that Jesus is the Savior. It's not enough that you know that the world is going to hell. It's not enough that you know there's a heaven and a hell if you don't say anything about it. You're just holding the truth. You're not giving out the truth. They hold it in unrighteousness. <clears throat> now notice this. In other words, they knew. They knew. Stop and think about it. Do you realize that at one time on earth, every person on earth knew God? Do you realize that? Do you realize that at one point in time, every human on the face of the earth walked with God in the cool of the evening? Yes, Adam and Eve. He would come down and walk with them in the cool of the evening. What happened to their offspring? There was certainly a communication gap somewhere, wasn't there? Sin entered in. That's the reason God told the Israelites, when you get into your country, he said, tell your children, when you sit down to eat, tell them about me. Tell them all the great things I've done for you. When you're walking in the field, tell them what I've done for you. Constantly, when you go to bed, tell them what I've done for you. Constantly be telling your children what I great things I have done for you. But what happens? We don't do it. We leave it up to the Sunday school teachers. We leave it up to the preachers. Half the time, our children aren't even in Sunday school. That's your job. That is your job, and that is your responsibility to train your children spiritually. That is not the job of the church. Now, our teachers do the best they can for one hour a week if they're here. But it's something that we need to be doing every day, every day. You know what? Growing up, I don't remember a time. Growing up, I do not remember a time when the Bible wasn't read in the home every single day. We also had what's called a Hurlebut storybook of the Bible. How many remember that? Anybody remember, the, remember that book? Okay. I learned more Bible from that book, Old, Old Testament from that book than anything else. But we were taught in the home daily. People don't do that anymore. Everything crowds it out. TV crowds it out. Sports crowds it out. Activities, school activities, everything else just crowds it out. And it's a tragedy. Now look what happened. Because that which may be known... Now, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it into them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, now keep this in mind. Now, even though you aren't teaching your children, or if you aren't teaching your children, if you are not teaching your children at home and those children grow up, the Bible says they're still without excuse because creation tells them there's a creator. There was a, it, it, it's, it's just amazing. It, it's just amazing the things that go on in the public school systems. I read a book, I, I think even quoted from it, about this professor. He had taught uh, evolution for years and years, and he had a couple of Christian young men uh, in his class, and he be they began to reason with him. And they just asked him, will you check this out? Will you check that out? And he began to check certain things out and realized there is no way, absolutely no way, 
that everything could have evolved, he became a, cre a, a Christian and a creationist. Then he began to teach that God created the heavens and the earth. And he brought out that, that, that when they first began uh, with the fossil theory, when they began to study fossils, the evolutionists thought this is going to prove evolution. And it proved just the opposite. And here's what he charged our educators with. He said, they absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt the theories that they're teaching in school are false. They don't work. They'll never work. But they leave them in the textbooks because they would rather teach those children a lie that they know is a lie than admit that there's a God that created it. And he said, they know it's a lie. They know it can't work that way. They have never found a missing link. Do you realize that? The greatest, bi the greatest botanist or biologist in the world is from London, England, and he said not only is there not a missing link between man and animal, there's not a missing link between anything. There's never been a, re a record where a shrimp turned into anything else, one flower turned into another flower, a horse evolved into something. No missing links in any of the species. And so scientists, because look what happened. Once they do that, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They became fools. They turned their back on the light and on the truth, rejected the truth in spite of all the evidence, and they became fools. So you know what they're teaching now? Now this is something. Since they can't find any traces or any evidence for things evolving. Now when I was in high school, it's been a long time ago, in our science books, we had pictures of the prehistoric horse. Has anybody ever seen pictures of the prehistoric horse? Wayne probably does. I think he used to ride one to school. It's been a long time ago, hasn't it, Wayne? But Anyway, they, they look kind of like a llama. They, you know, they don't really look like a horse, but this was a prehistoric horse. That was the missing link see, as it evolved into a horse known today. Well, what they do, how they do that, they begin to dig down in the earth, see. And the further they dig down, the further back in time they go, and they found the remains of the prehistoric horse. And so, oh, they were so excited. You, did you know that was their biggest argument was the prehistoric horse? They found the remains of the prehistoric horse. But do you know what? They, they shouldn't, they, they should have put their shovels up right there. Because guess what they did? They kept digging and they dug down a few more layers. Guess what they found? The skeleton of a modern day horse. So then, rather than admit, wait a minute, this thing wasn't even a horse, it's an animal that's extinct. What do they do? They just don't say no more about it. And they keep printing it in the textbook and pass it on to our kids as a prehistoric horse. So what did they do next? Now, well now, now they know that things did, their evolution means slow change. Slow change. Now, my wife says that, you know, I'm going through a process of evolution. I'm changing very slowly. She's working on me, but <laughs> it's a slow process, you know. She still can't get me clean up around the chair, my coffee cups and magazines. So what they did next, since they, they can't find any missing links, in other words, they go back however many million years they want to go back, they claim, so many, 50 million or whatever. They keep digging down there, and snails are still snails. <laughs> cats are still cats. Dogs are, they, they don't find, see, they find a lot of, of extinct species, but, but they, they can't find where anything's changing. So now they call what they ha they come out with now, and this is really brilliant. See, now this is the these now wait a minute. This is the guys with the doctor's degrees. All right, they're smart. If anybody knows, they know, right? Yes, yes. We all need to send our kids to college because they need higher education. So they come out with what's called rapid change theory. Now here's rapid change theory. A crocodile laid a bunch of eggs. For some unknown reason, one of them hatched out a bird. <laughs> I mean, they don't know why, but one of them hatched out a bird, and so that's where your bird species came from. See? Well, the only problem with, see, now, now they'll just throw that out, but that's, they don't want to talk about it. They just say that's a rapid change. 
We don't know why, but it was always a crocodile until all of a sudden a bird hatched out of the crocodile egg. Well, now, that's fine if you just shut up there and say, oh, okay, doctor. But what if somebody asked the question, if that thing hatched out a bird, what kept the rest of the crocodiles from eating it? Because it was a helpless little chick, right? Beep, 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 beep. Question number two, what did it mate with? Where did the rest of them come from, see? Isn't that stupid? But they, see, they, listen, they're grabbing at straws. They're so desperate. They're so desperate because they don't want to say there's a creator God. They'll do anything then admit there's a creator that created the heavens and earth. The most far-fetched things in the world. Now, they, they was talking about, one of the scientists was talking about the chances, the odds of spontaneous life. In other words, here you got an oil slick or whatever you want to call it, and all of a sudden there was a streak of lightning or something happened or some chemicals got together and all of a sudden there was a one cell amoeba and then it divided and it finally over billions and trillions and quadrillions of years why well, it finally evolved into something that could crawl up on the bank and then it finally got rid of the tail and climbed up the tree and learned to fly you know okay but spontaneous life where life came from they said the odds of that he gave the number another man uh, another man uh, uh, computed that out, and he said, here's what that amounts to. He said, if you would take half a dollar, and if you would cover the state of Texas with half a dollar, 50 feet deep, you take one of those half a dollars, and you take a magic marker, and you mark an X on it, stir it all up, and then you give a blind man one chance to reach down in there the size of Texas, 50 feet deep, and pull out that one half a dollar that had, a, had the mark on it, that's the odds of spontaneous life. But you know what this brilliant doctor said? He said, and I believe that's what happened, but I don't believe it could ever happen again. Golly, can you believe that? But yet they can't believe there's a creator God? That's just beyond their reasoning. Everything points to Creator God. But see, men are going away from God, and you're probably thinking, what in the world has this got to do with your subject? I don't know. I just got off on that. Because <laughs> I get mad when I get to thinking about what people are doing. But I'll tell you this. I guess that's why I wanted to bring all that out, and then I'll close. If you keep rejecting the life, that's where you're, half, that's where you're going. Do you know Why? Because when you reject the light, your heart will be darkened. And you'll be darkened. And it'll be darkened. And be darkened. The Bible says this. It says, God gave them up. God gave them up. And then it says, God gave them over to a reprobate. That means a lawless mind to do what they want to do. And believe what they want to believe. Listen. <clears throat> you hear the truth. And you reject the truth. And you reject the truth. The day is going to come when you can't accept the truth if you wanted to accept the truth. Because the only way you're ever going to accept the truth is through the power and the, and the agency of the Holy Spirit that does a work on your heart. And if you keep rejecting the light, God will reject you. But the only hope the world has is the gospel. Because the gospel is the only thing that God has given this world to save this world. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it. It is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, when you're talking to somebody about their soul, don't reason with them. Give them the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. And you know what? You can preach all around it and nobody gets saved. And I've been, I've been visiting in people's homes before, and, and they want to get off on all kinds of subjects. Well, where did Cain get his wife? Have you ever heard anybody do that? They want to get off on, what's that got to do with anything? 
Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior? That is the only, that's where the power is. It's not all, where did God come from? They'll get off on all kinds of subjects, and I've seen people stand there and argue with them and talk with them for two hours about all, and what difference does it make? I was with a, a, a preacher one time, and he was in a home, and this guy said, well, preacher, I want to ask you a question. Do you really believe, he said, if a man has faith as a mustard seed and he can move, uh, mother, uh, mustard seeds, he can move mountains, he said, what difference does it make? You don't even have enough faith to get saved. And here you're talking about enough faith to move mountains. See, they're just getting off the subject. They're just getting off the subject. But Paul said, I'm a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, a willing, a willing bondservant. My will has been submissive to his will. And he called me a divine calling, an appointment as an apostle, and he's placed me in a box, so to speak. He's given me a specific job. And you know what that was? The apostle to the Gentiles. Aren't you glad God included the Gentiles? An apostle to the Gentiles. Oh, he loved to preach to the Jews. But his calling was an apostle to the Gentiles. And every one of us have a calling. But you know what? We have one thing in, in common. Do you know what we're all called to do? The same thing, preach the gospel. That's what we're called to do. Why? Because that's the power of God in the salvation. Let's stand and let's sing. And Mary, would you like to come on back?